I didn't grow up as a Christian. In fact, I grew up in the house of an atheist. So even though my extended family were Christians, in my home, we never talked about God and sometimes even laughed at Christians because how could anyone put their faith in a God that you can't see? Why put your trust in God when you can trust yourself to make the life that you want? When you can trust in your education, your money, and your possessions? Why trust in God when you can trust your wisdom and who you know? I grew up not only learning how to be skeptical about Christians, but also skeptical of the church. Because in the church, you had all these Christians in one place, all believing in this God that didn't make sense to me. I can remember going to church a handful of times as a teenager, whenever my grandmother visited us, and I always found church to be so boring and so irrelevant. The music was nice, but I didn't understand what that guy up on stage was talking about, and I couldn't wait to get out. And though I found Christians to be nice people, I just thought that they were weird because they couldn't even talk normally like the type of people that I knew and hung out with. They kept saying phrases like, praise the Lord, or amen, after I said something. And they kept calling me brother. When I talked with my friends, they had their own experiences with church. Church for them always seemed like a place that they had to go to, but didn't want to go to. Others found the people very judgy or too dogmatic with their political views or just unfriendly. Others felt like it was an insider's club where you had to believe or dress a certain way in order to be accepted. So if you believe differently, you will look down upon. Some of my friends found the people very superficial and even hypocritical, while others saw church as a place that you only go to for Christmas, for Easter, for weddings, and for funerals. And so with my limited exposure to church, and trusting the experiences of my friends, I had my mind made up about Christians and the church, and this definitely wasn't for me. But when I turned 18 years old and graduated from high school, I had to go back to my home country of Singapore to serve my mandatory military service, and so I lived with one of my uncles and aunties who were Christians. So with my already formed biases of Christians, I figured that I would be staying with them over the course of two and a half years, but try not to be too influenced by them. But after my first month of living with them, I found my uncle and my auntie to be normal people just like me. They talked normally and had problems just like any family would, but they sought God for courage and wisdom to help them deal with it. They talked to each other with grace and encouragement instead of put-downs and condemnation. Whenever there was conflict, there wasn't yelling or screaming or giving the other person the cold shoulder, but they would openly talk about problems until things were resolved. I saw them pray together at night as a family with their kids and trust God to provide for them. And whenever my uncle talked with me, there was always wisdom that came out of his mouth and I somehow equated it to his relationship with God. Seeing all this had a profound impact on me. They even prayed for me every single night. They never pressured me, but invited me to go to their church. And when I went to church with them, it wasn't like I had experienced or imagined at all. People were really loving and friendly. And there was a community where it looked like people actually enjoyed being together. When there were events, everyone was there. And they wanted to be there to serve each other and the town that they were part of. Even though I wasn't a Christian, I met friends my age at church that invited me to hang out with them and to do life together. And it was just being with them on a regular basis that helped me to see that all this wasn't a facade. These people were genuine people who loved Jesus and wanted to learn how to do life with him in community with other people. And I had never seen anything like this before. But it was nice to be a part of it, even though I didn't believe any of it. I saw people praying for each other and helping each other out when there was a need. Eventually, I looked forward to going to church and just being around these people and experiencing the love that they gave. And in time, I found that I actually had a need for God in my life. And after lots of questioning and deep conversations... I decided to follow Jesus for myself. 
And do you know what happened? God really started to change my life. And this community of people spent time and helped me to answer my questions about God and answer my questions about my life. And the thing that sticks out the most is that these people just cared for me and loved me, which helped me to better understand the God who loves and cares for me. It allowed me to mature and grow in my faith in God. And that's the church. The church is the people. It's the people of God striving to live and love like God. You know, we're starting a brand new sermon series called Ecclesia, defining what the church was meant to be. Because we all have our own view of what church is, whether good or bad, healthy or unhealthy. And many times that view may fall short of what Jesus actually envisioned. And I get it. Some of us have had some horrendous stories of our own experiences with church or even church people. And I'm sorry if that happened to you. That wasn't what God meant for the church to be and to do. Somewhere along the line, people came up with their own version of church. And when that happens people get hurt. But this church that I experienced firsthand in Singapore caught, kept, and grew the vision that Jesus had for the church. And when I returned to America, there were other churches like that, and they also shared in that same vision of what Jesus wanted for the church. And so it's important for us to learn from Jesus himself what the church actually is and was meant to do. Because he was the one who actually came up with the idea of church. See, when Jesus came to earth in the first century, he called people to follow him so that they could learn about this new life in him. And the first people that Jesus actually called to follow him were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. See, he was telling them that instead of catching fish, they would catch men and women. With his help, they would help people to go from spiritual death to spiritual life in Jesus. With his help, people's lives would be transformed. But Jesus wasn't just calling people to follow him because these people would soon become a new community that would bring love, hope, and life to the people around them. This new community would be known as the church. And we find the first time the word church appears in the New Testament is when Jesus has a conversation with Peter, who is the leader of Jesus' 12 closest followers. And Jesus says to him, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The name Peter means rock. And God was telling him that he would transform his naturally extreme character into something that was solid and reliable. But Jesus also said that he would build his church using the ancient Greek word ekklesia. The prefix ek means out of or out from. The root word klesia is a form of the verb kaleo, which means to call. So the word ekklesia means those who are the called out ones. Jesus was saying that those who followed him would become the ekklesia the church who would be called out of the world to shine the light of Christ for all to see. The word church in this context is a congregation or an assembly of people. It's not a building, nor is it a place that you go to, or a service that you attend, or a sermon that you listen to. Church is not reading scripture by yourself or trying to follow God in isolation. Church is a people who would start a movement to seriously live and love in such a way so that others may find life in Christ. And Jesus gave his followers the five purposes of what this church would do. And it was based on two commandments that Jesus gave his disciples. The first is what we know as the great commandment where Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was asked, what's the most important command out of all the Jewish laws? And he responded by summarizing the entire Old Testament into two tasks. So we get the first two purposes of the church. The first 
is that the church was to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. The word that describes this purpose is worship. It is where we love and honor God through a life of obedience, and we magnify Him in all that we do. And the second purpose was for the church to love their neighbor as themselves. The word that describes this purpose is ministry. Ministry is service to others within the church body that demonstrates God's love by meeting spiritual, emotional, relational, and physical needs while healing hurts. Then, in his last words to his disciples before returning to heaven, Jesus gave them another commandment known as the Great Commission and assigned the church three more purposes. Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we learn that the third purpose of the church is to go and make disciples. We call this mission, which includes outreach, evangelism, extending out mercy and doing justice in the community outside the church body. Jesus is saying, as you go about your regular day, share this hope and good news to those around you. We are to reach people, stand in the gap for them, and tell them about the new life that they can have in Christ. We are to build bridges with others and show the world about the opportunity for salvation as we invite people into God's eternal family. The fourth purpose of the church is to baptize them. This purpose of the church is known as fellowship, which is identification in the family of God. People who consider themselves followers of Jesus are not called to just believe, but to also belong to a church community and family. Baptism is not just a symbol of salvation, but it's also a symbol of fellowship. It symbolizes a person's new life in Christ and their membership in the body of Christ. Fellowship means that you have others who walk and do life with you. The fifth and final purpose of the church is to teach them to obey everything that Jesus taught. We can sum this purpose up as discipleship. Discipleship is the process of helping people to become more like Jesus in their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions. This is where someone doesn't just have faith, but they start to mature in that faith as all aspects of their lives start to look more like Jesus. From this, we get the five purposes of the church. Worship, because the objective is to magnify God in all we do. Ministry, because the objective is serving others within the church family. Mission, because the objective is outreach, evangelism, mercy, and justice as we serve those outside the church family. Fellowship, because the objective is membership in the family of God. And discipleship, because the objective is growing to be mature in Christ. This was Jesus' vision and purpose for the church, that all the people of God who comprise this congregation or movement would live out these five purposes in their personal lives. Worship, ministry, mission, fellowship, and discipleship. Not one person does this like a pastor or ministry leader, but these five purposes are meant for anyone who identifies as being a follower of Jesus. Because the church is the people. It is the people of God striving to live and love like God. And if people strive to live this out in their own lives, then the church lives this out. And we find that after Jesus gave these commandments, his followers started to live out what the church was meant to do. We read that the first century church was devoted to discipleship and maturing in their relationship with Jesus. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. These followers of Jesus in the early church were devoted, meaning they committed to studying what Jesus said and did. That is what discipleship is. Because the way we become like Jesus is by spending time and listening to Him as we practice being and living like Him. 
This early church studied the scriptures, believed them to be the words of life, and then applied God's word to their own lives. And they didn't just do this individually, but together as groups and as a whole community so that they could help each other to mature in their faith. We read that this early church was devoted to fellowship, meaning membership in a body of believers. They were devoted to fellowship. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. See, these believers made a commitment to do life together, which means that there is no such thing as a solo Christian or someone who claims to be a follower of Jesus and has no community with other believers. And when you do life with others, it is the concept of iron sharpening iron. Because it is through being in relationship that you will grow exponentially in your faith. Because people can walk alongside you and even lovingly point out blind spots that you may have. I've seen many Christians think that they can walk with Christ alone and eventually, like a burning hot coal that is taken away from the fire, their passion and intimacy with God starts to cool off. Eventually, other things take priority over God and they get caught up with the challenges of this world all by themselves. Soon, God becomes an afterthought. Instead of being devoted to Him, they end up being devoted to other things. But here, because people identified as being a family of believers together, we read that the disciples made time for each other, eating meals, hanging out, and enjoying that God was bringing all sorts of people together. Everything in common meant that these people were all on the same page. Their goal was not to live life just to benefit themselves, but to leverage the resources that they had to benefit those around them. We read that the early church devoted themselves to ministry by serving others. Scripture says, They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That means that if someone in this community had a need, they did what they could to meet that need. People gave their time and were even willing to sell their possessions if necessary for the common good of other people. They did this because of their love for Jesus and for their love for their neighbor. They were generous with what they had because they believed in a generous God who provided all that they had. It is people saying, hey, I heard that you needed help paying your rent. Let's figure out how we can help. Or they were saying, hey, are you having some stress with life? Hey, why don't you come over or maybe even give me a call so that we can talk about it and pray? Or it's people saying, hey, I heard that you're not feeling well. Well, we're going to bring you dinners throughout the next month so that it's one less thing that you have to think about and do. It's people thinking about the needs and actually doing something about it. And we read that the early church was devoted to worship where they magnified God in their lives. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer, praising God. They made time to worship together, not just individually, because they found value in corporately being together. This allowed for people to commune with God as they worship and praise Him for all that He was doing in their lives and in the community that they were a part of. There is nothing like being in a place where you can love and worship God with other people, where you become available for people to know and to love you, where you can come as you are and hear encouragement from God, and where others can pray for you when you're stressed out or seeking a breakthrough. And the early church got in the habit of meeting and worshiping together, and God knit their hearts together as they saw all that He was doing in and through their community. And lastly, we read that the early church was devoted to mission. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, these believers would continue to meet, and there was such a presence in their community that people started to take notice. People outside the community saw that there was something undeniably different about these believers, and the church enjoyed the favor of the people. This allowed them to serve their greater community, earn people's trust, and eventually share the hope that they had, which helped their neighbors find new life in Jesus. And the combination of these five purposes, worship, ministry, 
mission, fellowship, and discipleship that the church devoted themselves to living out caused God to add to their numbers daily those that were going from spiritual death to spiritual life. When the people in the church live out these five purposes, not only do their lives start to change, but the lives around them start to change. And I'm so grateful for the church because it was the people that helped me to mature in my faith. It was the people that taught me how to talk with God, to love Him, to spend time with Him, and to live for Him. It was the people who lovingly walked beside me and did life with me. It was the people that helped me to not just think of myself and my needs all the time, but to leverage the hope that I had to serve those that were looking for hope. It was the people that helped me to articulate my faith about Jesus so that others could respond to him. And I was thinking that if God can change my life this much, then everybody needed to know about this relationship with Jesus so that they could have the same kind of life. At the time, I worked as a public high school mathematics teacher, and I quickly came to realize that my students, their parents, my faculty members, were constantly asking questions about their lives, searching for answers, and wondering about God. But they didn't have a place to go to, or many people that they could trust with their questions. On top of that, when I would have conversations with such people about God, I found that a majority of them had made assumptions and had views of God that were false, kind of like I had when I was growing up. And all of this was preventing them from knowing the true God for themselves and the life change that He offers. And so I started to ask the question, how do I help these people to get to know more about the God that they were searching for? If they have questions like this, I'm sure a lot of other people around the world must have similar questions about God as well. It was during this time that I felt God was telling me, Edwin, you start the kind of church that encapsulates the five purposes that Jesus intended for the church. A church where real people could encounter a real God as they did real life together. A church where people lived in such a way so that others may find life in Christ. So my wife and I casted a vision for this kind of church to our friends and to the people that we knew. And they said that they wanted to be a part of such a movement. And so we gathered a team of people that were devoted to living out these five purposes as we strive to become this kind of community for the people in the city of Malden. We organized teams so that we could create worship environments for people to love God. We started life groups during the week where people could be discipled, study scripture together, learn how to share their faith, and learn how to live life with God. We did ministry and mission outreach programs in the city of Malden. People from our community were generous with their time and their finances, which allowed us to make time for people and serve people in the city. We had cleanups, outreach to the homeless, and helping them to find permanent shelter, helping to meet food and housing insecurities, helping the city to take steps towards racial reconciliation, offering English classes to our immigrant neighbors, providing financial management classes so people can take steps to be financially free, partnering with police and city officials to meet needs and love people. We threw parties so people could celebrate, fellowship, and be together. We served food and more food as we invited our neighbors to experience being part of this church community that God was forming. And God added to our number, not just those that were being saved, but those that were looking for a healthy spiritual community to be a part of. And God continues to move. Then the COVID-19 pandemic hit and we stopped meeting physically, but the church never stopped meeting. Instead, we moved our services and midweek activities to an online platform. But we continued to strive for those five purposes as we saw God working in different ways in spite of a pandemic. We saw people come to faith and new people join our church community. We saw more people joining in with our life groups during the week. We saw people still being ministry and mission focused by meeting the needs of those in the church and in the city. 
we saw people giving financially, which allowed for us to continue to serve and be on mission. And though online has benefits, there are also limitations. And so we long for the day when we can physically gather as a church in Malden, where we can physically worship God together, do life together, serve together, reach people together, and change the world together. Because yes, we can be online together, but there is nothing like being together physically. And so with the pandemic rounding a corner, and with the development of vaccines, and people being more comfortable with gathering, we figured that it is time for us to plan to safely start meeting together physically so that we can continue the work of being a transformational church in the city of Malden. We want to continue to be the church where everyone is welcomed. No matter who you are or what your background is, you are welcomed here to meet Jesus and be in community with us. We want to be the church community where everyone is needed. If a church is going to fulfill its five purposes, then we have to move from being spiritual consumers to being spiritual contributors. It is playing an active role in the community that you are part of. It is getting out of the mindset that I come to church to be served, but that I am the church and so I serve. Everyone has something to offer in bringing Jesus to others, and so everyone is needed in order to do that. And we know that when everyone is welcomed, and when everyone is needed, then everyone is changed. That when we all live out the purposes of what Jesus intended the church to be, hearts are changed, lives are transformed, and people make a difference. We want to continue to be the kind of church where people live in such a way so that others may find life in Christ. You know, it takes a lot of work to come back physically. And I'm asking you to prayerfully help us to make this possible. To be the hands and the feet that make worship, ministry, mission, fellowship, and discipleship possible. So that together we can create environments on Sundays and throughout the week where everyone is welcomed where everyone is needed, and where everyone is changed by God. And so in order to do this, we are forming a team so that we can start having physical services in the fall. We are calling this team the Dream Team because we will be helping to make Jesus' dream for the church a reality in Malden. We are asking people to consider three questions. Are you comfortable and able to come back physically? If so... Will you help serve to make coming back physically as a church a reality? And if you are unable to come back physically yet, how can you still play a role in being the church that God intended for Malden? Over these next eight weeks, we will continue to dive deeper into Jesus' dream for the church and how he is inviting us to play a role with him so that others can find life in him. And not only will we be talking about this on Sundays, but beginning this week, we will be offering online life groups that will meet on various days. These groups are great places to have deeper fellowship with others as you join in on what God is wanting to do in and through you as the church. Now, I would like you to imagine what your life would look like if you personally devoted your time to consistent worship, ministry, mission, fellowship, and discipleship. How would your relationship with God change and how would you change? How would the lives of people around you change now and for eternity? Your family, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, how would they all change because you reordered your life around these five purposes? What would it look like if you lived in such a way so that others could find life in Christ. See, when Jesus had that conversation with Peter, he also gave a promise to Peter. And that is the same promise for us. Jesus said, And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Which means that not only will Jesus build his church, which is his people, but the promise is that the gates of hell will not overcome it. 
If the church devoted themselves to these five purposes, the world would be turned right side up, meaning that the church is a movement that is on the offensive to set people free from the bondage of sin, to bring reconciliation to God and to each other, and to offer love, forgiveness, mercy, and freedom. The church is the hope of the world, and you are that hope to those around you because the God who is invincible lives in you and is with you. And if the people of this church can embrace this devoted life to Jesus individually and corporately, the gates of hell would be overrun and destroyed. Hell and its potential population would be severely reduced and the world would be changed. This is the purpose of the church. And this is why we started High Rock Malden, where we can all live and love in such a way so that others may find life. Because what we do in this life will echo in eternity. May we continue to strive to be this kind of church together. Let me pray for us. God, we don't ever want to live in a way where we fall short of what you had intended for us. Nor do we ever want to miss out on the purposes that you invite us to live out. So God, grant us Grant us the courage to trust and follow you in all areas of our lives so that others may find life. And help us to realize that church is not a place that we just attend, but where we do life with you as we do life with others, as we change the world together. And so God, help us to be this kind of church and let that begin with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, the church is the people. It is the people of God striving to live in love like God. And if you don't have a relationship with God, and you want to experience this kind of life that He promises, then know that you can start a relationship with Him today. God loves you, which is why He came as Jesus in order to make our relationship with Him right again. He came to remove that sin wedge that prevents us from having any sort of relationship with the God of the universe. He knew that the consequence for our sin is death and eternal separation from God, which is hell. And so Jesus chose to die on a cross for us so that our sins could be forgiven and where we could start to do life and experience the kind of life that he intended for us. And on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead and he conquered death so that whoever would put their faith in him would find new life in him now and for all of eternity. If you realize that you need his grace, that you need his forgiveness, and that you want to experience his love, then I want to invite you right now to ask Jesus to come into your life to save you from your sins and to transform you into the person that you were meant to be. If that is your desire today, then repeat after me saying, Heavenly Father, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins so that I can be forgiven. I turn from my sins and I ask you to teach me what it means to do life your way. I don't want to do life my way anymore. So fill me with your Holy Spirit, transform me, and make me into the kind of person that you meant for me to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you pray to ask Jesus to come into your life, then that means that you now have a relationship with the God of the universe and that you're a part of his family. Please email us at info at hierarchmalden.org to let us know of your decision. And we would love to follow up with you and give you some resources so that you can grow in that relationship with God. Now let us enter into a time of worship as we reflect and respond to God.